It's Sunday morning and we are studying in the book of Revelation. Most of the world doesn't know anything about it. Most of the so-called Revelation teachers or prophecy teachers don't have any idea what it's about. And that's because they don't pay any attention to the first verse of the book. And in the first verse of the book, uh, John the Revelator is writing. John is writing this book. He's in a little island off the end of what we call Turkey. They call this Asia Minor uh, here. This is Asia Minor down here. And there's a little island called Patmos right off the tip of the Turkey here, down here, somewhere in the edge of the Aegean Sea here as it meets the, great, the Mediterranean or the Great Sea. There's a little island there called Patmos. And he wrote to seven churches. <laughs> there were more than seven churches <coughs> in Asia Minor. There was the Church of Troas up here. There was the Church of Colossia. Colossia was not a, uh, one of the seven churches. And there's the Church of Miletus down here, about where my finger's pointing. Ephesus is right up here above it. And you had a lot of churches there all over this area. But uh, John was writing to these seven, and seven is the number of refinement. That's why he was writing to seven. And each one of the churches had something wrong with them and that they needed to uh, correct. And the first verse of the book of Revelation says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he, or God, sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And we've said this word signify is the word semiao, S-E-M-E-I-O-O. And semiao comes from the word simeon, and that's the common word for sign. If you'll notice, the word sign is in the word signify. Signify. Sign is a part of the word. It means to give a sign or a pointer a pointer, something that points to something. So the signs are illustrations. They're actually illustrations. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the illustration they use has uh, means exactly what it says. It is a idiom or it's a type or it's something along this line. Now we've been reading over here. We've been talking about the bottomless pit. And there's some things I want to clear up about the bottomless pit. We've said that the bottomless pit cannot possibly be what has been sold to the American public by prophecy teachers. Uh, Jack Van Ampey and Hal Lindsey and these guys, they'll say the bottomless pit is uh, these are demons coming up out of some hole in the ground or they're demons coming up out of some nuclear explosion or it is helicopters coming up out of a nuclear explosion. That's what Al Lindsay says. It's just utterly outrageous what they're saying because the beast comes out of the bottomless pit. The beast comes out of the pit. And where does the beast arise? Well, we know the beast was over here in Daniel 7. And the beast is a world-ruling system. World-ruling system. Well, the beast actually began in the garden there in Genesis Genesis, the third chapter, uh, there in verse 2, it says, the, uh, the verse 1, the scripture says that the beast was more, that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. So the beast in the garden, what was ruling the world in the garden was the serpent. Serpent, and serpent is the common word, nakash, in H-C-H-A-S-H, and it is a derivative of the word, that's spelled the same way, which means to enchant or to make to feel good, to feel good. And that's what the beast is about. It's a feel-good system so that people will be able to be deceived and follow the system. The beast was in the garden. We find the beast over here in Daniel 7 in the form of a lion, and that was Babylon. We've already gone through that, Babylon. The Babylonian lion, the most regal of all the kingdoms, and Babylon had wings of an eagle. And to have wings of an eagle was an old ancient idiom that meant to move fast like an eagle flies across land. When we say as the bird flies, we mean without going down some road or in particular, you can move faster. And it had wings like an eagle. 
and Bab the Babylonian armies moved fast. And then you had Babylon overthrown by the bear or the Persian Mede Empire. Persian Mede Empire. And that's the bear. And the bear is the largest carnivore. And they had the largest armies that ever existed. Then you had the leopard. <laughs> the leopard <coughs> is... Uh, the leopard was uh, a type of Greece or Alexander the Great's empire and uh, he overthrew the Persian empire. This is Alex, Alex Great, Great. And he overthrew the Persian empire around 332. Persians overthrew the Babylonians three, uh, 539 B.C. This is all B.C., B.C. And Babylon... Uh, uh, overthrew Israel, overthrew Israel, or carried Israel away into captivity in 586 B.C. That's southern Judah, southern Judah, and northern Israel, 722 B.C. by the Assyrian, B.C. by the Assyrian Empire. And Assyria was part of Babylon because Babylon was founded by the Assyrians, by the Assyrians. So this is all one, Assyrians and Babylon. And then, you had the beast with iron teeth, iron teeth, that overthrew all these others. And as they would be overthrown, Israel would be in that. When Israel was carried away by Babylon and by Syria, they're over here in Babylon, or what we call Iraq and Iran. And whenever the Babylon Babylonians would be overthrown by the Persians, that dude didn't do anything for the Jews. They just continued to be ruled by the empire that took over. And that's what happened here. And the Grecian Empire was like a leopard, and, and I keep saying the leopard was a, a, a killing machine in the jungle. It's uh, one of the most efficient of all the cats when it comes to killing, and that's what Alexander the Great was. He was like, like a leopard. And the beast with iron teeth, that's always equated with Rome. Rome and iron was the strongest of metals back then. There was no steel alloys at that time. And this is the same system, as I've said, as I've said, it's the same system that is the head of gold. It's the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's image, image in Daniel the second chapter. Daniel the second chapter, it's that same image. And it is the head of gold. Thou art that head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar. That's Babylon. And then the breast would be of silver. Silver. And then uh, that would be the picture of the Persian Empire. And as you go down the image, the metals get stronger, but they get less precious. Then you had the bronze. And the bronze would be, some say that was copper, but... That would be the leopard type of Greece. And then, and then you had the, uh, the iron, iron legs, which is going to be typical with the iron teeth. And then you had the scorpions with breastplates of iron over there in Revelation, the ninth chapter. So the scorpions, scorpions had breastplates of iron, iron. And, of course, scorpions are false teachers. That's what scorpion is the word scorpios. And the verb form is scorpizo. Scorpizo means to scatter abroad. And Jesus said the hireling doesn't care for the sheep. He allows the wolf to come in and scatter the flock. Well, the reason we know what the beast is, the beast is rising over here. It's not coming out of a hole in the ground. It's not coming out of a nuclear explosion. It's coming out of the bottomless pit and that's not a good translation it's actually abusos a-b-u-s-s-o-s and they translated it a-b-y-s-s -S, and abyss means a place with no bottom no bottom well that's not this word here abusos it comes from the word bathos now it can mean bathos or it can also mean something that's deep. This word, buthos, I'm going to give you these various words. It comes from the word bathos, also buthos, 
and B-U-T-H-I-Z-O, Buthidzo. Let me give you this Buthidzo. You have to go with the context of the meaning of a word. You have to stay with context. If you would, turn with me over to... Uh, Buthidzo means... Now this is... This word, Buthidzo, it means to drown, to sink, to begin to sink, drown, sink, begin to sink. As though there was a depth to something. To drown, to drown you have to be in water that's deep enough. You have to be in deep water that you can't walk around in. Unless you're just stupid and you can't, you know, some people fall over in their bathtub and drown. Now that's the word buthidzo. This word buthos, buthos means depth or deep. Or even means sea. Sea, depth, or deep. It means something that's deep. When you place the Alpha in front of a word as a negative part against the word. It means if you place the alpha in front of abuthidzo, then you have something that does not sink because it is not deep. Or if you place the alpha in front of buthos, it means no sea or no depth or not deep. Well, you, you cannot use this at all times you have to go with the context. We know that the beast only rises out of the sea in the sense that the borders of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome are on the borders of the, uh, of the great sea. You have to, whenever you're, whenever you're looking at a text, you have to go with the context. We know that Babylon rose out of the sea, but it didn't actually rise out of the waters of the Mediterranean. It didn't come up out of the waters. It only rose out of the sea in the sense that the borders were around the, the sea. And the sea was believed to be an evil place because they believed demons lived there and they believed Leviathan was there. They believed, all kind, they believed the whales were these evil demons. These people were very uneducated back in that day and time. And they were terrified of the sea. We've talked about that. They were afraid of it. Even the apostles looked out on the sea and they said saw Jesus walking on the water, and they said it's a spirit, except they didn't use the word pneuma, the common word for spirit. They used a word that meant a demon. They said it's a phantasm, our word fantasy, a phantasm, P-H-A-N-T-A-S-M. They said it's a phantasm. Let me give you this word bathos, where you find it. Let me give you some of these things where you find it in Scripture. Go over here in Luke 5. Luke 5, so I can, I really want you to see these things. Luke 5. And we'll look at some of these verses where you find these words. Luke 5 and verse 7. 5 and verse 7. Now this is where Peter is fishing, and Jesus and Simon... Uh, in verse 5, Simon answering said, Master, we've toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And Jesus told him, let down the nets, plural. He says that, launch out in the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And, he, and Peter said, we've been working all night long and uh, it's a waste of time, so we'll let that down one of the nets, not expecting anything. That's why the net broke, because... Peter, as he normally was, wasn't showing faith. He had little faith, and he had his foot in his mouth again. He said, we'll let down one of the net, one of them. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net broke, and the reason it broke was because they didn't let down the nets, plural. That's what Jesus said, didn't he? And he said, we'll let down one, because we don't really believe you. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they, came, and they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Now, the reason they sank because it was a place deep enough to sink in. And that's that word, 
That's the word buthidzo, sink, because it's deep. It's a place that's deep enough to sink in. Well, we know that Babylon didn't rise up out of water. They rose up out of the sea only in the sense that they were on the borders of the sea. Now, I'm not going to go into all of this and uh, other than just to say it means to sink. You can come back and read this story for yourself. Uh, Peter fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The reason he said that he didn't believe God. He, if you read this, you'll think, what, what did Peter do wrong? He did what Jesus said. No, he didn't. He, he threw out one net, and that's why it break and they started losing the fishes because Jesus said, Rail it down your nets for a great catch. And Peter said, Sure. We've been toiling all night long, and you're going to make us catch fish? Yeah, he is. Now, look over here in look over here in First Timothy. First Timothy six. First and here's the word, here's the word buthidzo. This is talking about the love of money being the root of all evil. And this chapter, first Timothy the sixth chapter, here in let's read down to it. Uh Verse 6, For godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Now, everything you're gathering together for a rainy day, you're not going to be able to keep. That's why it's better to share some of it now than to pile it up. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich, those that desire riches, not, not you will be in the sense you're going to be, but you will to be rich, those that will to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men. That word drown is that word buthidzo. Now that's not water that you're drowning in, is it? This is showing you just how different these words can be. Uh, we saw that the word was sink into literal water over in Luke 5, 7. That's because... It was water deep enough. Deep is the key word. In 1 Timothy 6 and 9, it's the word drown. That's, but he's not talk, talking about drowning in water. He's talking about drowning in temptation and a snare, isn't he? He's talking about, but they that will to be rich in, are fallen to temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. You're going to drown in destruction and perdition. So, that doesn't apply the same way the word buthidzo. It would be like we talk about baptizing someone, and then I saw on the movie, I saw, uh, I was watching some something on the military channel, and it says, and as they, as the soldiers, as the Marines hit the beaches of Iwo Jima, they were, they were baptized with machine gun fire. It don't mean they were being dipped into machine gun fire. Okay, I baptize you. <laughs> That's not what it meant. Just the same way we use various words, they use some of it figuratively, as in this verse, and some of it literally in the sense of water that's deep enough to sink into. And the whole idea is that it's deep, and it'll drown you or you'll sink into it. Now, look at... Uh, Look at, now that's the word buthidzo. Buthidzo is only used twice in the Bible. These two places. Luke 5, 7 and 1 Timothy 6, 9. You have to apply something. In 1 Timothy 6, 9, it's figurative language, isn't it? In Luke 5 and 7, it was literal. And that's the only two places that you're going to find this word buthidzo. Then you have the word buthos. Look at 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. You have to go with the context if it's figurative or if it's not figurative. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 11. 11. And look here in verse... Uh, Paul is talking about He's talking about uh, his qualifications. He said, I'm going to speak foolishly. Let me brag a little. The way men would speak. And that's what he's talking about. He says, uh, 
I speak concerning reproach in verse 21 as though we had been weak. Howbeit, wherein any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. He's talking about false teachers preaching another Jesus coming to Corinth. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I speak foolishly. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. Above measure meant more than 39 stripes. If you got 39 stripes under a Jewish flogging, a beating uh, with a cat of nine tails, they would, 40 stripes was all you could get, so they would say, well, give 39 just in case you give one too many, because if you give one too many, you have to take the same number of stripes. So Paul said, he said, I was in stripes above measure. I received more than 40 stripes when I should not have, they shouldn't have broken the law against me. In prisons more frequent and death softs, of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. He said, the Jews beat me with thirty-nine stripes five times. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the buthos, deep. When you place the alpha in front of that, it means not deep, doesn't it? But Paul is talking about being in the bowels of a ship, being in the hold of a ship, being in the deep with the waves coming around him. He, we know that that happened to him in the 28th chapter of, uh, of Acts where he was shipwrecked on the Isle of Miletus and journeyings often in perils of waters and perils of robbers and perils by my own countrymen and perils by the heathen and perils in the city and perils in the country and perils in the sea. In perils and false brethren and weariness and painfulness and watchings often and hunger and thirst and fastings often and cold and nakedness. Besides all these things I have to put up with with the churches. You think you're having a hard time? Read this chapter from time to time. You're not having a hard time. Goodness gracious, he was running for his life. At one point he, he said, Timothy, when you come, come before winter and bring my coat. I only have one coat. And regardless of what the charismatics say, how Jesus and Paul was rich. Paul said, I'm not rich. Besides those things which are outside, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Whew. This guy had a lot to do, didn't he? He certainly did. Now, now that's the only place, a night and a day I've been in the deep. He's talking about in the bowels of a ship. That's what he's talking about. Now, let's look at this word, that's only used one time. That's the only place. He says, night and day, I've been in the deep. That's the only place you're going to find buthos in the Bible as a Greek word. Now, let's look at, uh, let's look at, at, here's the word bathos. When you place the alpha in front of any of these words, it means not deep. It doesn't matter what they are. Not deep. And it translates up buthos, not deep. It doesn't mean a place without a bottom. It means, it means no depth of God's knowledge. And we can see that because the beast had no... The beast started in the garden and the beast was Babylon and Babylon was founded on self. Revelation 17 and 5. And to prove that this means no knowledge... Revelation 17 and 5 says Babylon was the mother of harlots, pornea. And pornea means idolatry. And how, what was Babylon founded on? Over here in Genesis 11 and 4. When they said, let us build us a city and a tower and let us make us a name. Here's what it was founded on. Let us make up our own doctrine without any knowledge of God. This is what Babylon was founded on. You have to look at the construction of Scripture and see how Scripture blends together. Let us make us a name. That name is the word Shem. Shem was God's prophet. Shem had two brothers, Japheth and Ham. But God did not bless Japheth and Ham he says, Ham, the, Ham's descendants will be the servant of Shem. And we know that Ham's son was Canaan. 
and the Canaanites are going to be the servants of the Semitic people, the Shemites, and this is going to be uh, the Jews are going to come out of Shem because one of his descendants is Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. And Japheth will dwell in the tents of Shem. One would receive the inheritance out of the family, and the rest in the family would be taken care of by that one who received the inheritance. So what the people were saying, we don't like Shem telling us what to do. We don't like God saying what he uh, wants us to do. So we'll make up our own authority. And Shem was God's authority. And name is the word Shem. So when a person says, let me make me a name, he's saying, I will be my own authority. Oh, I'll have a big name in Nashville. He don't mean I'm going to have my name on the Batman building down there that says Jim Brown. That's not what it means. He's saying, I'll be my own authority. I will come up with my own doctrine. That's the whole point. I'll come up with my own doctrine, and there'll be no knowledge of God, will there? Babylon was founded on no knowledge of God. When you put all of this together, that's, that is the bottomless pit, or the abusos is the same thing. Not excuse me, the abusos is the same thing as let us make us a name. Let us make up our own doctrine, our own, our own shim. Let us make up another Jesus. Let us make our own gospel. Paul said some in this chapter, he said some will come preaching another spirit, another, another gospel, another Jesus. Well, they're saying we have no knowledge of God. We don't want any knowledge of God. You're going to find no knowledge of God in Genesis 11 and 4 just as you find it in the so-called bottomless pit, pit, and let's look at some of these verses on, on uh, Bathos. Look over here in Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Don't know if I'll read all of them, but Matthew 13. And verse 5. 13. And he's... And he's talking here about the parable of the sower. Let's start in verse 3. And he spake many things unto them in a parable, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. Deepness... There's no depth here. Had no deepness. That word deepness is the word buthos, or bathos. Placing the alpha in front of bathos, it means no depth, no deepness. Well, the Word of God is the picture here of the seed, so it has no depth of the Word of God, does it? That's what it's actually saying. No depth of the Word of God. And look over here in Mark 4. Mark 4. You have to evaluate all of these things to see what he's talking about. When he says the beast came come out of the bottomless pit, the beast comes out of the place. The beast is Babylon. It was founded on self or no knowledge of God, wasn't it? That's what it's founded on. Let us make up our own name. Let us make up our own doctrine. We'll make up our own Jesus, and we'll call him Jesus, and we'll use all of the words terminology of Christianity, but we won't tell anybody what anything means and everybody will be confused in the Baptist church, in the Church of Christ, in the Pentecostal church. And you won't know what anything is talking about. Now here in Mark, Mark 4, and he's ta- this is the same, the same parable. You'll find this parable in Luke 8. You'll find it in, in Mark. In Mark 4, in verse... Five, and some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. That word depth is the word bathos. Now look over here in Luke 5. Luke 5. <laughs> Luke the fifth chapter. You say, Jim, is it necessary to go through all these? Well, probably not, but I want you to see a bunch of these to see what it's about. In Luke 5, we already, I think we already went there, didn't we? 5 verse 4. No, we we went there, but we didn't give you this. 
launch out, verse 4, launch out into the deep. Launch out into the buthos. What we brought out earlier was uh, Peter down here, sink. We brought out down sink in verse 7. But in verse five, chapter 5, where Jesus tells them, now he left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the into the buthos. That's what he's saying. Launch out into the place, or excuse me, bathos. Launch out to where there's a lot of depth. That's what he's saying there. But you can only apply it if it's figurative speaking, and we know the beast is a system and it didn't rise up out of water. In this place, he's talking about launch out where there's a depth of something. Whether it's a depth of water, launch out whether if there's a depth of understanding, a depth of thinking. He's saying, watch, launch out into the place where there's some depth. This word depth can be used in any number of ways. Now, go over here to, to Romans. Go to Romans 8. This will help you. Here's the word bathos or bathos. Romans 8. Very familiar verse that people are familiar with. In chapter 8, Verse, let's read verse 37 down through 39. 37 through 39. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth. Depth of what? That's the word bathos. That's the word we're talking about right here. Bathos. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when he uses this word depth here, bathos, he's talking about something spiritual, isn't he? Everything must be applied according to how it's used. And when you go to chapter 11, chapter 11 Verse 33, 11 verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Oh, the depth of the knowledge of God. If it's abusos, it's no depth of knowledge, isn't it? Notice, notice that he's talking about God's knowledge has a depth to it, doesn't it? So, the beast comes out of a place where there's no depth of God's knowledge. There's no knowledge at all. It's a place of infinite void, as one of the uh, entomologists says. Entomology is the study of words. Etymology, not entomology. Etymologist. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. So he's talking about God's knowledge has depth, doesn't he? Isn't that what he's saying? So when you place the alpha in front of this word here, it means no depth of knowledge. It actually says that in this verse. It would say that if you put the alpha in front of, if you put the alpha in front of the word depth or bathos, it would be no depth of the knowledge of God, wouldn't it? That's what it would say. Sometimes you'll find the answers within the text of Scripture itself. If you'll notice, we're hitting this all along the way. And then go over here to 1 Corinthians 9. This is a favorite verse of mine. I quote it a lot. 1 Corinthians 9. Oh, excuse me. 1 Corinthians 2, not 9. 1 Corinthians 2. 2. Let's read verse, verse 9. As it is written, I had not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man, like Bill Clinton said, what we can do. What a dumb, dumb bell. He said that in his first inaugural speech. I have not seen or heard neither in the heart of man what we can do. You imbecile. That's not what that's talking about. Why in the world would he do that? Just take something out of the Bible. What we can do as Democrats and the what else? What an idiot. I had not seen or heard neither has entered in the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them 
that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, the bathos things of God. If you place the alpha in front of that, it says no deep things of God, but God's knowledge has depth, doesn't it? So he's talking about the great depth of God's knowledge. And he says, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. There's certainly depth in his spirit, isn't there? Now we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, because God's deep wisdom is not something man's wisdom can teach, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man, the psuchikos, P-S-U-C-H-I-K-O-S, the man of the senses, the physical man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. He doesn't receive the deep things of God. He does not accept, decomai, deep things of God. He doesn't accept anything spiritual. Dead men cannot, not only can they not accept Christ, they cannot understand the deep things of God, can they? You can't accept. Accept is decomai. It means to reach out the ten fingers and accept an offer that's been presented. Dead men do not accept Christ or accept anything. Dec is the word ten in the Greek. A decade is ten years. And decomai means to reach out and accept. Dead men do not accept deep things of God. They don't even understand them. So if, you, if you'll notice, going through all of this helps gives you a better understanding of bathos, doesn't it? Then go to, go to 2 Corinthians 8. Well, deep things of God is certainly not talking about water, is it? It's talking about something with great depth. And then you go over here to 2 Corinthians 8. And if you'll notice, this word bathos, when you place the alpha in front of it as the negative particle, the alpha preview, it negates the word. It means no deep things. It has no depth. And that's what Babylon was founded on. No word of God, but their own word, their own authority. That's why Babylon didn't come up out of a hole in the ground. It came from a place of no authority, saying, let us make up our own authority. No word of God. They made it up. Now, what did I say? It was going to 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8. Let's read 1 and 2. 8. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, Macedonia's Philippi and Thessalonica. That's up here in this area right up here. That's called Macedonia. Philippi, Thessalonica. You can just put that. The Thessalonians and the Philippians were up here in Macedon. In fact, that's where Macedon was considered a crude area of Greece. This was the classical section down in South Athens and Corinth where they had all their gods and all their philosophies. Up here was the backwoods that Paul was preaching to up here. He had more trouble with the, with the uptown high rollers down here than he did with these people up here. Philippi was one of the most dedicated to the churches. And in this chapter, chapter 8 and 9, he's talking about how the people from Macedon are the Macedonians. And by the way, Alexander the Great was from Macedon. He was a Macedonian prince. He wasn't an Athens prince, and he wasn't a prince from down here at Corinth. He was a country, country guy from up there. Now, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. That word deep is certainly not talking about water. It's the same word, bathos. Deep poverty abounded into the riches of their liberality. He said they were poor, but they gave anyway. This ought to be an example of people saying, I can't afford to tithe. Well, you can't afford not to. Now, that word deep is the word bathos. So it depends on, how, on the context of how it's being used, correct? Yes. That's, you can't just come up and say, it's a great big deep hole in the ground with no bottom in it. 
That's a bad translation. And then let's go to uh, Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. If you'll notice, most of the time this word bathos is being used, it's figurative language, isn't it? A few times it's mentioned for sea, but it's not particularly talking about the water when he says launch out into the deep. He's not particularly talking about the water. He's saying launch out to where there's something deep out there, uh, where there's a bathos. It could be a depth of anything else. It's a term that can apply any number of places. Where it's deep is what he's saying. Now, in Ephesians 3, look here in 3 and verse 18. Let's read 17 and 18. That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, in agape, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth, depth and height. That word depth is the word bathos. What is the height? To know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. He's saying this thing is even deeper than knowledge. It's something that's hard for men to comprehend. It's so deep. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now look here in, we'll give you one more of these. Revelation 2, 24. Go to Revelation 2. This, this is every time, what I've given you is every time this word Bathos, Buthos, and Bathizo. This word Buthos is mentioned one more time, Revelation 2 and verse 24. Revelation 2. Now this is every time Buthos, Bathizo, and Bathos is mentioned. This is the last time the word Bathos. Bathos is mentioned nine times in the Bible. Uh, Buthos is mentioned one time. Buthizo is mentioned twice. So the majority of the time it's bathos. And bathos is a word that has to apply contextually. You exegete, it, exegete means to pull the verse out according to the context. That's an exegesis. You pull it out according to the context, what has been said, what's being said what the definition of the word is, and what the contextual definition is. So he says here in 2 and 24, But unto you I say, unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan. See, Satan has a depth too. That word depth is the word bathos. If you had... Abathos, it'd be no depth of Satan. But Satan has a depth of no knowledge, doesn't he? As they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. So, we found out this is every time these words are mentioned. Now, let me give you a couple other things. We've talked about this word, abusos. It's translated bottomless pit every time it's translated in the book of Revelation, but there's two other times it's used, it's not translated bottomless pit. Let me give you those. Luke 8, Luke 8, Luke 8 is about the man of the Gadarenes. All right, Luke 8. Here's this man. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing. The, probably the greatest question I have asked, if there's no such thing as demons, then what is it went into the pigs? Jesus said demons were self. When Jesus rebuked him in the first chapter of Mark, 
Mark, the first chapter, when Jesus rebuked him, him is the word A-U-T-O, it's the word self. And the same man in Luke 4 is said to have an, he has an unclean spirit here, unclean spirit here in Mark 1, and he has an unclean devil in Mark in Luke 4, and devil is the word D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. So Damonion and unclean spirit are one and the same because this man over here, the, the Lord has marked, he inspires Mark to write unclean pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, breath, unclean breath, akatharos, A-K-A-T-H-A-R-O-S. We get our word cauterize, C-A-U-T-E-R-I-Z-E, -E, which means to cleanse something. Placing the alpha in front of that, it means not clean. Unclean breath, unclean demon, and Jesus calls it self. He says, no, it's you. He says, we, what have we to do, have to do, what do we have to do with thee? Use plural. Uh, Jesus used singular, masculine, gender, singular. He's talking to the man. It's you. You're the only one. So, so you can apply this everywhere you find demon. And when you get over to Luke 8, Luke 8, you have a man that is possessed with devils. And you can get all of this anytime you're studying one chapter. Study the sister chapters, Mark 5 and Matthew 8. Just remember 858 8, when you're studying the man of the Gadarenes that's supposed to be possessed with the devil. Man of the Gadarenes. Now, he's possessed with the devil, and possessed with the devil meant to be insane. That's an old ancient term. You can get that out of McClinic and Strong. Meant to be crazy. Then after the demons are cast out in the swine or after self, I'll tell you exactly what he was doing. He was saying, you think you're going to keep these demons around and you're going to consult with them and they're going to be familiar spirit or a family spirit. They're going to be one of your ancestors that's going to talk to you and guide you to good fortune or bad fortune. That's why you're among the tombs. You're up here thinking you're talking to your kinfolks that's been dead for years. And they call that a familiar. And a familiar was the word ob in the Old Testament. It meant a bottle. And they would talk, they would... Master ventriloquists and throw their voices into the bottle. And the bottle was not what we call a bottle. It was a goat skin bag. It would, they'd cut the goat's belly out and they'd, they would plug in one end of it and they would pour the wine in and out of this end. And these soothsayers would learn to throw their voice and pretend they were talking to dead people in a bag. And when they translated that out of the... When they translated ob, the word bottle out of the Old Testament Masoretic Hebrew text and they translated it into the Septuagint, into the Greek text. The authorities at 200 B.C. translated that word E-N-G-A-S-T-R-O-M-U-T-H-O-S. It comes from gastro meaning stomach. In means within. And muthos is the word myth. It means a myth in the stomach. They said this is not a bottle and you're not talking to anybody it's a myth in the goat's stomach the translators 200 BC said that they knew what it was so when the man you find the man after the after Jesus just literally transgresses the law of nature people say God wouldn't transgress the law of nature and cause swine to get the desire for self in them yes he would would he make a jackass talk? Huh? He did that, didn't he? Would he stop the wind right before this? Would he stand up in a boat and say, Shh, be quiet? And would the wind stop? Yes, sir. Jesus transgressed the law of nature every time he performed a miracle, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's God, that's right. And what he was saying is Mr. Legion... The guy said he had legion in him. Jesus didn't say he had legion. 
legion was about 3,000 people in a Roman army. He said, I got 3,000 female demons in me. Leg yard. Now, where did he get that idea from Jesus? What school did he go to to get his degree in demonology to say, I got these demons in me? Where did he get that? He got it from the culture he lived in. People said that when you were about half nuts, you had a demon in you, and it was a god. And he said he had it, and Jesus said, no, you don't. You got you in you. And you think you're going to stay up here in the middle of these dead bodies, and you're going to talk back and forth, and when they had a familiar, they wanted the familiar to be close by so they could talk to them and get advice from them. And so when Jesus cast, he says, here's what will happen. Let me show you what will happen. You think you're going to talk to them and you're going to converse with them. And among the pagans, the swine was one of the most popular of the gods. It was Osiris among the Egyptians. And you got to be a, it was actually the word boar, B-O-A-R, a male pig. And whenever you were in Egypt, when you died, you got to become a part of the great swine in the sky. That'd be a good song, wouldn't it? The swine in the sky. <laughs> so when, the, the point is, he was possessed with demons or he was nuts beforehand. And then after Jesus, Jesus says, here's what is, this is what this will do to an animal. It'll drive them so crazy they'll kill themselves. It's totally unnatural. We kill ourselves doing the same thing, don't we? Bronchial asthma, heart attacks, cancer. I really believe that whenever you stress and worry over stuff, your, your body opens itself up, your immune system opens itself up to disease. I believe that with all of my heart and soul because I've seen my body get well over the years to a degree compared to what I was at 45. I was a dying man at 45. I was dying. I would tell Mary, I'm not going to live to be 50. Couldn't breathe. Fought for breath 24 hours a day. You don't see me doing that now, do you? I'm not. I don't take really any asthma medicine at all. I'll have, have these sieges that come along, and it'll last for a month, a month and a half, and then I have to take that prednisone. As soon as the, as soon as the inflammation is gone, I'm fine. And that wasn't the way it was when I was 40 and 45. It was around the clock, 24 hours a day, all year long. Did the damage back then. There's been damage done to my body. If you'll keep yourself under stress for 25 years, you'll do the damage. That's what you'll do. And you'll pay for it. If I could live my life over, I know how to live now. <laughs> I don't sweat it. Don't sweat nothing. I would probably be as well as you could be. But the man, when they came and found him sitting clothed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. So you have possessed with devils, crazy, in his right mind, S-O-P-H-R-O-N-E-O. -E Sophroneo means sane. So what happens in between was self going into the swine. You know what insanity is? Self. That's what it is. If you'll get into yourself enough, you'll get crazy. Has anybody ever been crazy besides me? I have been literally bananas. I've been a basket case of great time in my life. If you've never been a basket case, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> so he was sane. Therefore, something happened from insane to sane when self went out of him. And here's what happened. Here's what happened. Uh, what was, oh, I was going to give you this, yeah. Luke 8, 31. Oops, I'm looking at the wrong thing. I flipped my page. 31, okay. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep, the abusas the place of no depth there was evidently no depth there that they were thinking of I don't know if it was a shallow place somehow they they ran out in far enough till they drowned and that's exactly what happened to them 
So when you're talking about the abusos, you're talking about something with no depth. Look over here one more time. Look at Romans 10, verse 7. Romans 10. This is the other place that the word abusos is mentioned. Romans 10. And verse 10 and 7. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? Who shall descend into the abusos? You mean Jesus is down in a hole in the ground at this point? When Paul wrote this, when he wrote this, where was Jesus? He wasn't in the earth, was he? When Paul wrote this, he was with the Father. Who shall descend into the abusos? But where is this from? Let's back up and read a little bit of it. Let's back up and read. But righteousness, in verse 6, which is of faith, speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the abusos? That is, to bring Christ again from the dead. Well, where is Christ? Where is he says he is? But what saith this? What saith what? Faith speaketh on this wise in verse 6. Faith speaketh when he says, but what does faith say? That's what he's saying. What does faith say? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth. How is, why is it in your mouth? Because out of the abundance of heart, the mouth speaks. You don't have to ascend up into heaven to get Jesus. You don't have to go down into the, the place of no knowledge. Because that's where Jesus is. He's in a place that we know nothing of, isn't he? He's not in the hole in the ground. When this was written, it was quoted from the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy. And notice what it calls it over there. Look here. It says, Who shall descend in the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. Well, you can't descend in the deep to bring Jesus from the dead because he rose the third day, didn't he? When this is written, he's in the heavens with the Father, wherever that is, which we know nothing about, do we? But what saith it? Here's what the word of faith says. The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Because of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. That is the word of faith which we preach that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart. Because he just said in the previous verse it's in your mouth because it's written in your heart, isn't it? You, do you get that? Yeah. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that is a reference back to the previous verse, the word of faith is not, I have faith, I get a Cadillac. If I say Cadillac, 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 I get a Cadillac. That's the charismatic. Say, the word of faith, it's in your mouth. Know what's in your heart, because God wrote it in fleshy tables of our hearts will come out of our mouths. And that's the word of faith. And confessing Christ is not a one-time deal. Confess homo legato. Logos and homo. Logos is the word word. Homo means of the same word or to agree with. How often do you agree with Christ? One time down at the front, I'd like to walk down there and confess Christ is my personal Savior, but I'm not going to agree with him out in public so I can be persecuted for it and have a daily cross for it. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God hath raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Well, confession is because it's already written in our hearts. It's not the confessing that, that births us. If it's written in our heart, it's going to come out of our mouth. But when it's written in our heart, is that's when we're born again, not when it comes out of our mouth. What comes out of the mouth is after it's written in our hearts, isn't it? So, and that's why he says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, in verse 13. 
But then he says, how then shall they call on him in whom they not believe? In verse 14, belief is the method of salvation. Paul told the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He didn't say, confess with your mouth. He will confess with his mouth if, if God births him. Won't he? But belief has to come from God. God has to put the belief in your heart because none seeks after God. So when we're looking at that word there, who shall descend in the deep? Look how it's written over in the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy. Who shall descend in the bottomless pit? No. Who shall descend into the place that we're not familiar with? The place of unknowing. Look here. Deuteronomy 30. I've, I've been wanting to go through this with you. Just go through all these places these things are mentioned. Then you can begin to understand how that you have to apply things according to the text and the context. I have people call me and they'll say, I was looking at my concordance and I, what, they got a list of the words. If you'll sit and examine those words, sometimes they're all related to each other. Have you noticed that? And it'll be the word that fits the text as the definition. You can't just come up and make something fit. It's got to fit the text. It's whether it's figurative, whether it's literal. Now, look here in Deuteronomy 30. This is where this is quoted from, and this is the word of faith. Look here in verse 11, chapter 30. For this commandment which I command thee this day... It is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up to heaven? Isn't that what he says there in Romans 10? Uh, who shall righteous speaketh on this wise? Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to Christ, to bring Christ down from above. And he says the same words in verse 13, uh, in verse 12 of chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring unto us that we may hear it and do it? Who's going to go up into heaven that will know to do the will of God? Neither is it beyond the sea. Ha! Huh. Remember the sea was a place of evil. And he calls it a busas over here. And we've said before, that Abusas, a place of no knowledge, was equated with the sea because there was no knowledge of the beast that came up out of the sea and they believed all the demons lived in the sea. Tammuz was a sea demon. Dagon was a sea demon. There were all water demons and they were sun demons. And they probably, in all probability, got that from the fact that Noah came up out of the waters and they took this righteous man and deified him as Dagon and Tammuz and all these sea demons. And they said this sea, and they were terrified of the sea. But if you notice, if you notice what they called Abusas or the deep in verse 7 of chapter 10 of Romans, over here in chapter 30, they're calling it the sea, isn't it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us? He's calling the Abusas, where it's originally quoted, the sea. And it's the same thing as bottomless pit over here in Romans 10. So the sea and the bottomless pit are the same thing. That's the point I'm getting at. And the sea is only the sea in the sense that it's figurative because the beast rises up out of the sea in the sense that its borders were on the boundary of the great sea. And to them, that was the great sea filled with demons. Who shall go over the sea for us and bring unto us that we may hear it and do it, but the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, thou that mayest do it. It's in your heart. You're not going to have, and if Jesus, it says, who's going to go beyond, who's going to go into the deep in Romans, Romans 10, 7, and over there in Deuteronomy, uh, the, the 30th chapter, verse 13, who's going to go beyond the sea? Well, was Jesus beyond the sea when Deuteronomy was written? Well, he was in a place of no knowledge, wasn't he? Let me give you something so you can understand. Go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. You have to tie a lot of things together. And you go over to the end of the book here in chapter 9.
And he's talking about all through here, doing what, what you can do while you're upon the earth because when you leave the earth, you're going to not know anything that's going on here. He says in verse 16 of chapter 8, When I applied mine heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes, and behold, all the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. When he says under the sun, he's talking about things that are going on on the earth. Under the sun is where men are working. When you get past the horizon and you go to the other side of the world and it's dark, people are in bed. They're not working there. That's the idea of this. They didn't have night shifts back then. They didn't have evening shifts. Everybody went to bed with the chickens. You get it? Because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. For all this I considered, the fact of the things that are going on under the sun that he talks about in chapter 8. For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. This is all in God's hand. God's doing everything. He's working our righteousness, isn't he? He works all things after the counts of his own will. He's doing these things to willing to do of his good pleasure. It's Christ working in you to willing to do of his good pleasure in Philippians 2.13. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked. I wonder what that is. Death. To the good and the clean and to the unclean. And he's talking all through here about while you're on earth, do what you can do under the sun because when you're out of here, you're not going to know anything that's going on here and the people here won't know what's going on there. To him that sacrificeth and him that sacrificeth not. As is good, so is the sinner. And he that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun of all the works that men do, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil and madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. They all die, don't they? They all do evil and then they die. For to him that is joined to all the living there is Hope for a living dog is better than a dead lion. You can get more out of a living dog you can out of a dead lion, can't you? Even though when the lion was alive, he was more fierce. But when he's dead, he's not worth anything. For the living know that they shall die. But the dead know nothing. Neither have they any more reward of things upon the earth, of things that are done under the sun. For the memory of them is forgotten. It's over. They don't know anything that's going on on the earth and we don't know anything that's going on there. And Jesus was beyond the sea or beyond. He was in the Abusos, the place of the unknown, wasn't he? Right? That's what it's saying. Who's going to go to the place of the unknown, of the unknown knowledge and bring Christ back? You don't have to do that. He's already in your heart. That's what he's saying. And Deuteronomy 30 puts it, in verse 13, beyond the sea. Like Bobby Darren, I guess. Also, their love and their hatred and their... Also, their love and their hatred, verse 6, and their envy is now perished. Don't have it that anymore here. Once you're dead, it's over. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun, it's all over with. So those that are here don't know what's going on in the place of the unknown. And who's going to go beyond the sea or into the place of no knowledge of God? Because Jesus was certainly not on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, was he? He wasn't on the other side of the, of the Mediterranean Sea. And he wasn't in a bottomless pit, a place with a hole in the ground with no bottom. He wasn't in a nuclear explosion, was he? If you read all these verses, you're going to see 
that the bottomless pit is actually a place of no knowledge of God or it's a place of no knowledge. It can be used in the sense a place where you don't know anything about. What if I said mystery? Unrevealed. Revealed is to take the cover off. Mystery means to keep the cover on and keep it a secret. And I had not seen or rehearsed neither in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him, but he's revealed these deep things to us. So if you go through all of these various places to find all these words, and you can do this. This is not hard. Anybody can do it. You simply take your word study concordance, and if you can't find one of these, you get an Englishman's concordance. You look up the word. You look up the word in your... It, when these guys say, when you hear a preacher say, that's so many times in the, in the Bible. Well, that's not some mystery. That's not because they're brilliant and smart. They either count them or they have one of these books. They'll have this book, and this is, uh, that's 8, 899. Let me, uh, 890, let me see, 899, is that what it is? Yeah, 899, look here. It's not like you look up your Strong's number. I'll tell you all my secrets because I'll, get, get, I'll go get more between now and next week, okay? <laughs> and I'll give them too. Most preachers won't give you their secrets. They, that's the only secret they got in you. They can't reveal that to you because they, they won't look mystic anymore, you know? 899. All you have to do is get a word study concordance or an Englishman's concordance of the New Testament. You get one of the Old Testament and you look up this word... These words that I gave you, there's bathos, Luke 24, 1. Uh, here's here's uh, bathos. And you got some other words that are related to it here. 899, where's 899? Here. Deepness of earth, yeah. Here's the word bathos, deepness of earth. Here's every time it's mentioned in this book. And you go and look at the other words, uh, 899 and, uh, and 900, 901, 900, 901. We went through all these. That's all we did. And all you have to do is look up the number in your concordance. And it'll tell you here that bathos is mentioned nine times. Got it right there. You don't even have to count it. It's not like I was a genius when I did that. I just want you to know how phony preachers can be. Then I'm going to tell you, this is one of the secrets. Anybody can look it up. A, a fifth grader can look it up. It's, people are not as smart as they look when they try to look smart. I hope you learned that. Now, can we see what, can we see a bottomless pit in a more clear, uh, precise area? You have to apply it depending on the figure of speech, if it's literal and still, even when he said launch out into the deep, he just meant launch out into the place where there's a depth of this stuff called water. He's not so much talking about launch out into the water because you could say launch out into the deep thinking. You could say launch out into the deep uh, principles and ethics of life. You could say that. And you could use the same word in any given place. So, now let's go back over to Revelation Revelation 20. And this is kind of a... I've been wanting to give you all of these along the way so you can get a hold of the fact of how to think when you're doing this. All right. How much time do I have? Boy, it took a long time to get through that, didn't it? Now, we find... The, well, I'm going to probably have to leave here for a minute. Leave this verse. So we find that this is the line, the bear and the leopard, and we find that the beast, if it, if it was coming up in Daniel 7 out of the Mediterranean Sea, it was coming up. The only people that God had given truth to in the entire world from Genesis to the New Testament, to Matthew, 
was Israel. No one else had the truth. Everybody else had no knowledge of God. And God forbid Israel to preach the truth to the Ammonites or to the or to the Moab Moabites, Moabites or the Moabites or the Ammonites or the Syrians or to Tyre and Sidon. God forbid that. You can't have that. It's not time yet. Even there was a Syrophoenician woman that Jesus she came to Jesus and said, My Daughter's sick and I need some help. Please, God. Please, Jesus. I know you're God. He said, it's not time yet to give the crumbs to the dogs. And dog was a term for Gentiles. He said, it's not time. Not till I die on the cross and not till Acts 2 when God pours out of his spirit, which is his truth on all flesh. It's not time yet. So only the Jews had the, but he consented anyway because she was imploring him with all her heart. So all this over here was no knowledge of God. Only the Jews had knowledge of God. There's more than just looking up a word. You have to look at these words, look at the context. And notice several times we spoke of the deep things and the knowledge of God. You have to do more than define a word. You have to learn the text, learn the scripture. And after you do that, look real close at what you're reading. And you start seeing things more clearly. Now, we also said, we know that Babylon didn't come up out of a nuclear explosion. So it can't be that. It can't be a hole in the ground because Babylon started over here in Genesis 11 and 4. And Babel is a reinstitution of Adam and Eve worship in the garden. And she went after all that's in the world, demon herself or demonion, all that's in the world, the lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That is not the doctrine of God. That's no knowledge of God. God says, thou shalt not, and she says, I will take my own knowledge, and I'll ignore your knowledge when I eat of the tree. Didn't it? What's she saying that? I'll have my knowledge, and I won't accept your knowledge. If you stop and look at a scripture, you can see things in it that it doesn't say exactly. He didn't, he didn't say, I don't want your knowledge, I have my own, but that's what she was saying in essence when she ignored his knowledge ignored his word, and said, I'll go after the tree if I want to. And that's the doctrine of the devil, the doctrine of Satan, isn't it? All that's in the world, distributing fortunes. That's what demon means, distributing fortunes. Now, now we've got, I'm gonna, I don't know if I'll have time to get very far into this. You've got three places, well, not three places, but you've got three things coming up out of the, not bottomless pit, but the place of no knowledge. No knowledge of God. No truth. All of the world lives in a place of no knowledge right now. I believe the apostasy, when Paul said the day of the Lord will not come in 2 Thessalonians 3 and 2, <coughs> excuse me, 2 and 3, the day of the Lord will not come except to come a falling away first. That's the word apostasis. That would be a removal of God's knowledge because it comes from apo, this is the word falling away. And what are we falling away from? What is the church falling away from? God's word, God's truth, isn't it? God's knowledge. You fall away from the knowledge of God. Apo means a removal of stasis from stasis. means to be upright. That's the person that lives by the knowledge of God, lives by his word. He's obedient to truth. Obey God. We have to obey the gospel, Paul said. Uh, we have to obey righteousness. We have to be, be obedient to faith. From stasis we get staros, and staros is the word cross, and we have a daily cross when we, when we preach the exclusive cross. Exclusive cross. Exclusive cross is the one Jesus died on. It's not his cross simply because it was made of wood. It's because it was for his wife only. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So when he died on his cross... When we preach his exclusive cross for his predestinated elect family, people will crucify us. When a man doesn't believe in predestination, doesn't believe in the sovereignty of God, that God, that Jesus loved his wife only, he has dismissed the knowledge of God, hasn't he? Yeah. And that's an apostasis. It's a removal of the cross, not only of the daily cross, but of the exclusive cross of Christ. And when he removes the exclusive cross... He removes the knowledge of God. You can't really have an understanding of the Bible believing in free will. You cannot. 
Man doesn't have a free will. The Bible says that over and over again. It is not of him that willeth or of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. We're born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. If you think a dead man can make a living decision, when the Bible says there's none that seeketh after God, you have thrown the knowledge of God out of your life. I don't believe a man can fight you over predestination, just fight you and be a believer. It's got to scramble a man's brain if he is elect of God. He may not accept it all of a sudden, but he can't fight it. Say, I hate that doctrine, then you hate God's knowledge. And you have no depth of the knowledge of God. Men who don't believe in predestination, the sovereignty of God, they don't believe that God doesn't love everybody. When he said he loved Jacob and hated Esau, before they were born, before either one had done any good or evil, he's not talking about nations. He's talking before either one of these children were born. They had not done any good or evil. People say, he's talking about nations. To build a nation, you've got to do evil. You've got to lie and cheat and steal and kill people. You can't say before a nation is born, God loved one and hated the other. That's ridiculous. Did they become nations? Yes. But he said, before they were born, as it was said unto Rebekah, the elder shall serve the younger. There in the 25th chapter of Genesis. Jacob will be served by Esau, and I will love Jacob, and I will hate Esau, and Jacob will be a rounder, and he'll be a scamp, a scamp, he'll be a scoundrel, he'll be out there deceiving people, and I'll have to cut into his heart. If I should have loved anybody, it should have been Esau, but I love Jacob, and I hate Esau. And if you don't believe that, you hate the knowledge of God, and you're living in the bottomless pit. You're living in a busos, a place of no knowledge. It's amazing how the world is, how Lindsay talks about the bottom of this pit being a, a nuclear hole in the ground and helicopters being the scorpions coming up. That's the most ridiculous, stupid thing I ever heard in my life, Al. It's dumb. Because the scorpions come out of the place of no knowledge too, don't they? The locusts, let's go back over there. There's some things on this I need to show you. Back to Revelation 9. Revelation 9. All right. Do we have any time? 12 minutes. Boy, I'm not, I'm not even going to get started on this. I, want you, I don't just want you to remember. I want you to remember. We went through every place that word bottomless pit we hadn't gone through all the places but we went through the fact that the that the beast rises out of bottomless pit beast rises out of the abu sauce or the place of no knowledge no knowledge and that's in revelation 9 but the beast was over here in daniel 7 Daniel 7. Well, it's rising out here in Daniel 7. It's already risen in Daniel 7 out of the sea here, out of the borders of the sea. Babylon has risen up, and it's being overthrown by... It's, in fact, Daniel is prophesying the overthrow by Persia before Persia even comes along. And then he's prophesying about the overthrow by Greece and overthrow by Rome, and there is no Roman Empire when he's talking about that. So it's over here. Now, when we get to the mark of the beast, mark, I keep saying the beast is not a him, it's an it. I'll just say it one more time. When you get over there in that 13th chapter of Revelation, the beast, and it's talking about the beast, Totherion, the beast, Totherion, that's neuter gender. And everywhere it says he and him and his, his should be it and its. And that's the way it is in your interlinear Bible because it has to, be, the word is A-U-T-O-U and it has to be neuter gender or it has to be uh, masculine gender and it has to follow the gender of the antecedent. The antecedent is the noun it refers back to. And the noun is totherion, which is neuter gender. How do you know that? You look it up in a, you get your spelling out of your interlinear Bible and you go to a, 
you go to a parsing guide or to an analytical lexicon and then you have to memorize your Greek alphabet and you look it up in here and it'll tell you it's, that, that it, you'll, it'll tell you that it's or two and that it can be neuter and masculine but it has to go with the antecedent. The antecedent is the noun that all pronouns refer back to. Jim is preacher. He. He refers back to Jim. It has to be masculine and gender just like Jim. It cannot say she. Or I can't say uh, Jim is the preacher. It pastors the church. You can't say that because it is neuter gender. It has to be he pastors the church. So whenever you get he and his and him there in Revelation 13 referring back to Tolthion, it's neuter gender. Well, you mean those guys made a mistake? You bet your life they did. Yes, sir, Reed. They wanted the beast to be a man, evidently. Sometimes they just stuck things in there that they wanted to be. It's not him and his. And they make all these movies. Stupid as smooth as I've ever seen in my life. The Omen. How dumb. The only place he ever gets up to, and he's got it written on 666 back here. That stupid, dumb, ignorant movie makers. And all he becomes is ambassador to England. I don't think that's going to rule the world. It's not a man. It's an it. It was always an it. It was a world ruling system. How about New World Order? We said last week, how about Bilderberg Group, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, North American Union, European Union, the EEC, European Economic Community. They're trying, the Asian Union, they're trying to come up. If it's not these people, then who is it? They'll say, we're not a conspiracy, and they'll laugh at people for calling them a conspiracy. Let me read the word conspire to you. Conspire. To breathe together. Agree. Unite. Hmm. Not necessarily evil to plan or act together secretly. What gets me is the Bilderberg Group meets. The Queen of England's there. The President of the United States there. The big money people of the world are there. The Rothschilds are there. Money controls the world. Doesn't it? The bankers control the world. They always have. The J.P. Morgans are there. The Vanderbilts are there. The, the Rockefellers are there. The Queen, the Kings. The, and they're getting together to meet secretly and discuss plans of trying to learn how to get along in the world. They're not official. It can mean to, it can mean to act secretly to, to commit a crime. Or it can mean to combine or work together for any purpose or effect. Any, it can be... They're thinking we're meeting together here and we're trying to come up with a way for the world to get along with a world order and we're doing it with all the honor that we can muster up. But the Bible says not many mighty, not many wise in this world, not many noble are called. Let me put it this way. Not many presidents or queens of England are called or rich people or Rothschilds or any of these other people that meet with... They can believe... If you watch some of... I've got a... Uh, DVD called The End Game. And they can be over here meeting with the Bilderbergs coming out of one of their motels like they did in, in uh, Toronto at their last meeting. And then the people outside are with their cameras, you're trying to tear up America. And these guys over here that are meeting, they're laughing and grinning at them because they say, our, our intentions are honorable. So they laugh at the guys that's accusing them just because they're honorable, but they're meeting together secretly to kind of put together a world system in honor. And then they're going to say, Jim Brown, now look, we're doing this honorably, but you're going to have to be quiet. They think they're doing right. These guys over here making fun of them think they're doing right. And these guys over here don't know it's going to happen. And these guys over here, they don't know they're working right into the hands of God. And they think they're doing it to be honorable. If it's not the Bilderbergs and the Trilateral Commission, these guys, who is it? What I'm saying, if there's going to be a world ruling order, do you think anything's going to rise up and be bigger than these people who are the biggest in the world? There's nobody bigger than the Bilderberg Ranch. Nobody has more money than the Rothschilds. 
Nobody. They have in the hundreds of billions. They control nations and kingdoms and kings and wars and start them and stop them. And they think they're doing people good when they're doing it. And when they kill us, they're going to think they do God's service there in the 16th chapter of John, aren't they? I don't believe when men are conspiring, they're doing it necessarily to do evil. They think they're doing good when they're doing evil, aren't they? That's the reason they laugh at people calling them a conspiracy because they're saying, we're doing this for your own good. We're getting the queen together and we're getting the kings and the big princes and you've got David Rockefeller and, the, and he's the big, big honcho along with a couple other guys. And There's a beast world system rising up. I don't have hardly any time, do I? All right. We're going to get back to the, I'm going to go, what I'm going to do is show how the, whew, there's so much to this. I'm going to show you how the, how the scorpions come up out of the pit, and scorpions are false teachers. And scorpions know nothing, do, right? They don't know anything. They come out of the place of no knowledge, just like the beast comes out of the place of no knowledge of God. Well, scorpions evidently are Babylonians because all idolatry started at Babel. Let us make up our own name and false teachers, which are scorpions, make up their own doctrine, don't they? So they do the same thing. That They're actually more or less like the representatives of Babylon. They're like the second beast of, that speaks for Babylon. In fact, it never occurred to me until I was standing here just now. The scorpions may very well may be this beast, this second beast in Revelation 13, in verse 11, and beha I beheld another beast, and that word, another beast, is alas, therion, and that's also neuter gender. So it's a system, it's a religious system that speaks for the beast. Well, you have, you have the harlot riding upon the beast in Revelation 17. The harlot is the spokesman it's a religious system for the beast that's what a harlot was was a religious system she's the mother of harlots she's the mother of all idolatry she was founded on self or let us make us a name you have the beast and you have the religious system that rides upon her how in the world can you have an international world religion how can you do that it's not going to be a one world religion in the sense of everybody believing the same thing it's going to be a one world religion when you say, Catholic, hold my hand. I'm a Baptist. Church of Christ, hold my hand. Church of Christ is going to say, Buddhist, hold my hand. We're going to let, all, we're going to let you believe what you want to believe, and I'm going to believe what I want to believe, and we're going to tolerate one another with political correctness. And they're all believing the same thing. They don't even they're, and they're believing the same thing, and they don't even know it. They're just <laughs> believing in another God, and they all have no knowledge of God, right? That's how it's going to happen. Is you're not going to get Muslims to become Catholics. Catholics become Muslims. And they're too big worldwide in order to, to annihilate or obliterate any of them. The way they're going to do it is hold hands. And then you'll have a world religion, won't you? And it'll all be the same. It'll just believing in no knowledge of God and they'll all be in the bottomless pit. They'll all be in the Abusas, the place of no knowledge. I've run out of time. I'm going to come back. I really wanted you to see all these places these words were so you'll see. In fact, if you notice, if you go back and study some of them, it'll talk about the abusos or, or the bathos in the knowledge of God, the depth of the knowledge of God. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth and your word. Lord, let us see this book the way you intend it to be seen. Thank you for allowing us to understand that if this is figurative language, Lord. Deal with our hearts and crush us under your hand because you said we have self has to be crushed out of us. That's the demon in us. God will praise you and glorify you for all things. Lead us to your elect. Lord, I get weary and so tired sometimes. Lord, I pray you'll give me strength to stand and continue to stand, having done all to stand and to continue. I pray for the flock that you'll strengthen them and cause them to grow strong in the truth. This is such 
the desire in my heart, Lord. And we pray that you'll be with us daily in everything we do. Let us witness for you. Take our cross and die daily. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. <laughs>